So, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had good lunch. We, we welcome you to uh, an exciting, hopefully exciting, great debate on natural versus anthropogenic threats for life on Earth. And just to recap, I would like to give a free, uh, brief introduction. So the motivation for this great debate was that uh, a potential weakening of the Earth magnetic field uh, has received in recent years a lot of attention. And one scenario could be that a uh, magnetic field reversal, reversal might occur. And in this great debate, we tried to answer some of the following questions. So what are the consequences of increased particle fluxes of severe space weather events? What can we learn from other rocky planets in the solar system and beyond? And what are the, the effects that will be put into perspective? No, see, the effects will be put into perspective with the timescales and consequences of the different scenarios of anthropogenic climate change. And I would like to briefly introduce uh, the panelists, or mention the panelists, and detailed introduction will follow. So we have Ilya Ososkin, Olga Malandraki, John Tarduno, Eric Wolf, and then I would like to hand over to Alana Mitchell. She is a Canadian science, jo science journalist, and she will be the moderator of the discussion. Thank you very much, Margit. Um, I thank you for coming, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Armageddon debates. We're, <laughs> we're going to be talking about a whole range of different threats, potential threats to life on Earth. Um, we, we are hoping that this will be quite a, a lively and uh, exciting debate. Uh, and so we're going to, I'm just going to invite the, uh, once we get into our discussion, I'll invite the, uh, the panelists to leap in and interrupt each other with gay abandon. So we're going we're gonna to hope to do that. I'm, I'm a journalist, a Canadian journalist who writes about science and um, my fifth book has just come out in January. It's called The Spinning Magnet and it's about our Earth's uh, magnetic field. So that's one of the reasons I'm here. But I've also written a book about climate change called Seasick, which is about how climate affects the ocean. So that's how I fit into this little piece. Um, I want first to introduce our, um, give a, a bit of a detailed introduction of each of our speakers um, in order. So uh, what I'll do is introduce everybody, then we're gonna have a small uh, uh, moment of light entertainment from Hollywood. And then each of our speakers will, will talk about uh, his or her area of expertise, and then we'll debate here amongst ourselves, and then we'll open it up to the audience. So that'll take us, I think, to the full hour and a half. So Ilya Usoskin is the head of the Ulu Cosmic Ray Station, um, a vice director, vice director of the Center of Excellence of the Research on Solar Long-Term Variability and Its Effects, which is called Resolve, of the Academy of Finland, and he's also a professor there. In 2018, this year, he won the Julius Bertels Medal here at the EGU. He um, created the first full physical model of cosmic ray-induced effects in the atmosphere. Um, this is, of course, a truncated bio, but you get the, you get the drift. So that's Ilya. Um, Olga Malandraki is a senior researcher at the National Observatory of Athens. She's an expert in solar energetic particles. Um, she's done analysis on them through uh, the crafts Ulysses, ACE, Wind, and the Stereo mission. She is the coordinator of the Hesperia Horizon 2020 project um, of the EU, which looks at space weather, and she is the recent co-editor, or she is the co-editor of the book that has just come out called Solar Particle Radiation Storms Forecasting and Analysis. Um, the Hesperia Horizon 2020 Project and Beyond, which was published by Springer just this year, 2018. And of course, she is um, involved in the Hesperia Horizon 2020 Project, um, which is a, was a forecasting tool for solar weather. Hesperia stands for High Energy Solar Particle Events Forecasting and Analysis. So that's Olga Malandraki. John Tarduno is a professor of geophysics in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Rochester in New York State. He is also a professor of physics and astronomy. He's one of the world's experts in paleomagnetism, which is what the Earth's magnetic field used to do, and therefore also potentially how it has evolved over time. He's also an expert in when the Earth's magnetic field began. Um, he's applied that to geodynamics, geomagnetism, and environmental change. Um, he founded Rochester's Paleomagnetism Laboratory, and he's led field research all over the world, the Pacific Ocean, Australia, Botswana, India, Japan, Lesotho, New Zealand, South Africa, Swaziland, Zimbabwe, the High Arctic, and the Sahara. He's won a raft of awards, as have all of our 
panelists, um, including the Guggenheim and the Price Medal from the Royal Astronomical Society, and last year won the Petrus Peregrinus Medal here at the EGU. Eric Wolf, um, our final panelist, is an expert in climate change, and I did note that it's sort of three to one on this uh, He's uh, going to have to stand up for <laughs> a whole body of science there. He is the Royal Society Research Professor in the Department of the Earth Sciences at Cambridge University in the UK. He's a chemist who has spent his whole career, 30 years, looking at ice cores in Antarctic and Greenland and tracking how what they tell him about what they tell us about the changing climate and pollution levels. Um, uh, he has chaired the science committee of the European project for ice core in Antarctica, which is called EPICA, and it d which delivered an 800,000 year archive of, uh, uh, from Antarctica's Dome C core. And he is one of the premier explainers of climate change in the world, including for the Royal Society and the National Academy of Sciences. Let's welcome Ilya Usoskin. So uh, that was how American scientists explained to the American government the problem. I will be more moderate round uh, about such a effects. And uh, first, uh, we made some estimates, uh, and first say that uh, we do not say that the co uh, Earth core can stop. Mm -hmm. Just say, can we think of a reversal of geomagnetic field? What can be the effect? And in very simple estimates, we assume that the, during a reversal, the dipole geomagnetic field is gone. What remains is a quadrupole, but we will probably hear more details how it really goes. It's very simple est estimate now. Uh, since I'm the first presenting uh, the ideas. I would like to uh, summarize actually what could be an effect of the geomagnetic field dis disappearing. First is the atmosphere ablation, <coughs> uh, but for the time of very short uh, period, it's actually negligible because it, during few hundreds or tens or even thousand years, the effect is small. So we are not discussing about that. Then geomagnetic shielding, as was mentioned there, protects us from uh, cosmic rad radiation, mostly galactic cosmic rays and sporadic solar energetic particles. So uh, there will be some enhanced radiation effects, which uh, can destroy ozone layer and uh, which uh, in turn protects us from solar UV radiation. So I will very briefly say on that. And uh, of course the radiation uh, not shielded by the geomagnetic field can go uh, closer to the Earth and may affect satellites, uh, low orbiting satellites, because all high orbiting satellites are already outside the uh, geomagnetic field. And geostationary L1 missions, distance missions, so it's not a dramatic problem. Very uh, briefly, if we can see the radiation at, at Earth uh, by solar energetic particles, uh, the upper panels show the normal irradiation, uh, what we have now during the normal geomagnetic field. If there is a reversal with a dipole field, then uh, almost the entire Earth is irradiated by the uh, solar energetic particles as in the polar region. I came from northern Finland. I live in the region where there is no geomagnetic shielding and still alive. <laughs> That's one proof that nothing dramatic happens from this point of view at least. So it will be, but it will be all around the Earth. Solar energetic particles, they are known to uh, destroy ozone. <clears throat> and in this very simple uh, s uh, simulation, uh, we, sorry, the slide, uh, the panels are interchanged a bit. So the left panel shows the uh, ozone effect 
uh, if there is no geomagnetic field and the right hand panel for the uh, normal geomagnetic field effect, this is the ozone mixing ratio deviation uh, for one of the strongest solenergetic particle events recorded directly uh, in the space era which took place on January 2005, and this is zonal mean uh, for the latitudes 20 to 50 degrees north. And the vertical, so the horizontal axis is a, a day of January 2005, for instance. Uh, the event happened on the 20s, and the vertical axis is the altitude. Sorry for the negative. Altitude, uh, it just because of the model simulation where the, uh, the, that axis is pointed towards the, the Earth. So you can see if there is no geomagnetic field, the less panel, uh, the effect is stronger, but it's around 30% depletion of, uh, of ozone. <clears throat> and then it recovers relatively fast. Uh, there were some estimates of the effect, and uh, here, this is my last slide, just to estimate uh, the effect of UV radiation on the Earth in case of no geomagnetic field, comparing to the normal uh, geomagnetic field. And the left panel shows the so-called uh, 200-year average. These pictures were taken from a paper by Winkler et al, 2004. And as uh, for different scenarios, we now discuss the highest scenario, E. And you can see that uh, the strongest effect of enhanced UV radiation is 2.5%. This is mostly due to galactic cosmic rays because of the reduced shielding of galactic cosmic rays. And the right-hand panel shows the effect during uh, the solar maximum with a lot of uh, solar energetic particle events. Of course, the enhancement here is uh, stronger. It's 15%, but still, I don't think it can burn the Earth like an apple in the movie. Just 15% more UV comparing to normal level. So, my, well, it's not conclusion, it's starting point. It would not really be a deadly real hazard for the life being on Earth. Thank you. Olga. Hello, and thank you for the invitation to take part in this nice uh, debate. Uh, well, I will discuss uh, the space weather uh, aspect and present some basic uh, uh, terminology also. So what are the solar eruptions? We have uh, outbursts of extreme inter in, uh, electromagnetic radiation from the sun. These are the solar flares, and uh, this come, uh, this is a how this uh, look from uh, as recorded by the SOHO spacecraft. And uh, you have a range of uh, wavelengths observed from uh, radio up to gamma rays. Uh, these solar flares can hit the atmosphere and cause uh, satellites to uh, go to lower uh, orbits. Uh, coronal mass ejection is another aspect of solar, uh, another uh, solar eruption. You can see here uh, massive, gigantic clouds of interplanetary uh, gigantic clouds of plasma getting injected into interplanetary medium. And uh, this uh, arrive in uh, some hours or some days at Earth and can cause uh, geomagnetic storms. And last but not least, the solar energetic particles that also Lilia highlighted. Uh, these are uh, particles that are ejected in interplanetary medium. They take uh, minutes to arrive at Earth's orbit, and they can, be, uh, they can endanger the lives of uh, the health of astronauts on uh, interplanetary missions on their way to Mars uh, or on the ISS, and uh, be a threat to human exploration um, vision of uh, humanity. So uh, these effects can harm humans in space. Uh, however, uh, life on Earth is not exposed, and I Agree totally agree with uh, Ilya's uh, position that life on Earth is not exposed 
on the, uh, based on these solar eruptive events directly. So uh, the, these uh, CMEs, these eruptive phenomena, when they arrive at, at Earth, they travel in interplanetary medium, they arrive at Earth, and they meet a shield. And that's the protective shield, the magnetic field of the Earth, where uh, the, uh, most of the energetic particles are deflected and uh, do not reach the ground. Um, so you have this protective shield which uh, supports life and uh, which leads to no hazardous effects for people on, uh, on the ground. This is an invisible cocoon, we would say, which is shielding Earth against all these uh, massive and eruptive phenomena. However, what is the problem? Although there is no direct effect on life, there is indirect effect. There is direct effect on the human technology uh, that our civilization and uh, society uh, highly relies upon. And uh, this is where the term space weather refers to to what uh, the term space weather refers to. So we have these variable conditions on the sun the, uh, throughout space in the Earth's magnetic field and the upper atmosphere, which can influence the performance and reliability of space-borne and ground-based technological systems that we have. And uh, these adverse conditions in space, we now know can cause disruption of satellite operations, communications, navigation, electric power distribution grids, and of course, this leads to socioeconomic losses and impacts on our society. Uh, can you imagine we have this a big extreme event at the sun, and um, this can cause, for example, a bulk, uh, the failure of a bulk uh, electric power grid of a country, a, a blackout for days. Can you imagine what chaos it will be and what tragic uh, results will be there for people in hospitals, for uh, people stranded in lifts in all over? So these, these are indirect effects, but they could lead certainly to human, uh, human life losses. And uh, just to mention, since that's my, mostly my expertise, uh, as Ilya mentioned, uh, very fast particles may have uh, enough energies and break through this shield. Uh, and they enter the ionosphere of the Earth. Uh, this happens easier over the poles of the, of the, of the Earth. And uh, this has an effect to possibly the high inclination LEO satellites, which are there. So it's the technological effects that we have from SCPs, and they can be vulnerable to SCPs. They can even uh, get out of the, their orbit and even uh, I mean, not usable at all. The ISS, which has an orbital inclination of about 52 degrees. And also, uh, since these SCPs can also affect signal propagation between Earth and satellites, we rely on these satellites for uh, our telecommunications. Uh, we have absorption phenomena, uh, increased ionization absorption of radio waves in the high frequency and very high frequency uh, bands. In terms of human health, we have aeroplanes uh, traveling over the pole. We have aviation, we have uh, concern for human health. The radiation dose there can increase during such an SCP. And this specifically applies to high latitude flights and polar routes. And so it's a problem for frequent flyers, for commercial uh, aviation and for air crew. So what we need is mitigation of these uh, effects. And a way to do it is forecasting of these uh, SCP eruptions at the sun. And that's where uh, the project that uh, was mentioned, uh, that's where the Hesperia project, you predict these 30 to 50 MeV. What is proven is that greater than 30 MeV protons are the ones which are hazardous for human life. The particles start to penetrate spacecraft walls and uh, astronaut suits. And um, they have biological effects, hazardous biological effects. So uh, the point here is you use very fast particles, electrons, to predict 30 to 50 MeV SCP events. Electrons are precursors, they arrive earlier, and they give warning for the uh, 30 to 50 MeV protons. These tools, here is how the prediction, the real-time SCP prediction, is publicly available at our site, the Hesperia website at the National Observatory of Athens, and you see the uh, prediction of 30, 60, and uh, 90 minutes ahead of the proton event, which is important. And here we also have another tool which predicts these particles that uh, break through the shield, this greater than 500 MeV, and uh, you, you have a warning of about 15 minutes earlier than the uh, current state of the art and the other uh, systems that are available. And these predictions are also publicly available, real-time ones, in the, in the Hesperia uh, website. And you can see more information. Uh, I would say 
uh, we think this book will be a reference for some uh, years because we have the recent results and the description of our uh, SAP forecasting. So uh, I think the magnetic, it's obvious, the magnetic field is a big field and we would like to talk about the scales, I think, how fast the changes will be made with respect to the time scales of solar storm. Thank you for your attention. John. So, um, first, I don't want to defend the movie The Core, um, <laughs> but at the same time, I, I do want to um, address this question. Uh, for some of us who knew about the movie The Core as, as it was developing, we actually had some, some hope that it might actually describe the real situation, which is, uh, I hope I will convince you, is actually really scientifically fascinating. But unfortunately, it went off the tracks pretty, pretty badly. Um, okay. Click which one? Left. It's not going. OK. So um, as far as we know, um, and, and, and we know this well from uh, numerical simulations, the field during a reversal is, is really messy. Um, you know, we might think about it as being quadrupolar. Uh, that's the simplest uh, assumption. Um, but it's probably multipolar. So we can think about um, there might be pathways for um, particles into the atmosphere in many different places around the Earth. But it doesn't disappear to zero. Um, so we always have some net magnetic shielding during reversal. So I want to just make that point clear. Um, I, I want to, uh, I think, for those of you who aren't um, in this field, um, kind of give you an illustration of some pictures um, to maybe convince you why we think that this is an important issue right now in terms of the Earth's magnetic field. And this is one that bridges outside of my field. Uh, this is a result from um, one of the NASA uh, spacecraft. And what you can see here is, is a region uh, that is com completely lit up in this kind of orange color. And um, this was actually not the intent of the spacecraft, but when it was uh, doing some tests, it um, became very sensitive to proton counts. So you can see what is lit up here is a region um, where it has increased proton counts. And that's obviously really bad for satellites. Um, so, so what is this region? Well, this corresponds with the region um, where the Earth's magnetic field today is very weak. And it's getting weaker. Now, in our field, we kind of call this the South Atlantic Anomaly. Now, technically, the South Atlantic Anomaly is an ionospheric feature, but uh, our field sort of borrows the term, and we refer to the, this low area where the Earth's magnetic field um, has low intensity. And so there's this correspondence. We have this, this change in magnetic shielding, we, and, and that's um, why we have these two phenomena. But why is the Earth's magnetic field low here? What's, what's going on? Um, so, the other background here is that the Earth's magnetic field that we know really well, and we know the field really well because it's from magnetic observatories and we know it from satellites. Now, my field is paleomagnetism and we do our best to learn about the ancient magnetic field, but it's very difficult for us to determine the magnetic field on these types of time scales and these rates. And what's clear here is that this is just a plot, uh, sorry for the jargon on, on, on the vertical axis, but uh, versus um, time. And the Earth's magnetic field, the dipole magnetic field is decreasing in intensity. Okay, and it's decreasing at a, a rapid rate. So 9% over the last 160 years. Okay, so that's, that's so rapid that that tells you that there must be something going on in the core to be driving this decrease in intensity. So, um, 
Now comes the debate. We have a record that's 160 uh, years long. Okay, why would a credible scientist want to make the line that's dashed there, dash it into the future, um, into thousands of years? Well, you really shouldn't, but I'll, I'll give you some, some reasons why you might want to think about that. The first I've already given you is that this rate of decrease is unusually fast. If it were to decrease, decrease further, in about 1,500 years, we would get, I believe, into a point where we call them Earth's magnetic field excursional. So there are times in the past where Earth's magnetic field has gone toward a reversal, but hasn't gotten all the way there and has come back. And if we're now beyond 2,000 years, at the same decrease, we would get into a reversal. So again, why would you do this when you just have such a short record? Well, to me, I think the important thing is, um, let's see if this works. This is a record um, from Court and Constable, and there have been um, increased records of es trying to estimate what the Earth's magnetic field would be like on archaeomagnetic time scales. So again, for people who aren't in the, in the field, uh, let's simplify this. So the cool colors should be characteristic of northern hemisphere and the hot colors should be characteristic of the southern hemisphere. So this is the field at the core mantle boundary. So let's just move this into the f future. And, and you see, hopefully, that, wait a minute, uh, now we have some cool colors in the wrong hemisphere. Okay, in particular underneath Africa and Patagonia. And particularly the African one, these are something that we call reverse flux patches. Um, that's probably responsible for the South Atlantic anomaly today. So, so think about that. At the core mantle boundary, at these locations, the field is reversed. So, the rate of decay and this pattern is what drives some scientists to think about this, think about this wild extrapolation. But it's an incredible debate. Uh, not everyone in, in the field thinks that we are, are in this uh, stage of early reversal. Um, some people do. Um, so again, the correspondence, South Atlantic anomaly and these reverse flux patches. So I, I think I'll, I'll leave it there, um, um, perhaps bring up um, some other points but um, later in the, in the discussion, but, but really just kind of leaving you with this, that the Earth's magnetic field, even if we're not going into a reverse state, is unusual. And I was thinking about this um, sort of in preparation for this, for this debate, and, and there's, there's evidence, which I won't go into here in this South Atlantic anomaly region, that we may be seeing recurrent uh, behavior. And that's from some of the work of my group and some other people that um, we've seen periods in the archaeomagnetic record, the record in the last thousands of years, where the field sort of is going up and down in, in unusual rates. My personal belief is that, um, and this is um, paralleling to what we see in numerical reversals, is this picture is what you would expect before a magnetic reversal, in the very early stages of a magnetic reversal. The problem here is we don't know if this is going to lead to a reversal. Okay, uh, it may not. But if you had to say, you know, what would the picture look like at the very earliest stages, I would say that that's what it would look like. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Eric Wolf. Okay, I didn't prepare any slides. I got kind of hoodwinked by an email that said that it would be really good if we didn't have any slides and then everyone else prepared some. So. But anyway, you don't want to see more pictures that show you what you already know about what the IPCC said about climate. So we'll take that as read. I, I wanted to discuss climate as a risk and broaden this out 
to what the debate says, which is a comparison of different risks, a comparison of anthropogenic and natural risks, um, thinking about timescales, consequences, and physical processes, which is what the, the title says. So I study ice cores to learn about past climate. Actually, ice cores also tell us something about this, because in ice cores we see the result of the cosmic rays coming in when the magnetic field weakens as an increase in beryllium-10 in the ice cores. So actually, from the ice cores, you can get an idea of how fast things happen and how much happens. So that's one of the pieces of evidence that's actually one step further than the magnetic field. But if we're comparing different um, risks, and this is just one of the natural risks, I mean, there are also, actually, only last week I was asked about comparing climate with the risk of an asteroid impact. And there are also things like giant volcanoes and so on, which we could also, which we could equally have brought into this, this same framework. So to compare those risks, we need to think about the likelihood of something happening. And you don't just mean the likelihood of it's happening. I mean, the magnetic field will reverse one day. That's 100%. So it's the likelihood of it happening within the next 100 years or something like that. The impact of, it, of, of something happening and our ability to do something about it. So at least as far as society is concerned, those seem to be the three important dimensions. So for climate change, I could say the chances of us going to two degrees, just between you and me, because no, no one's in here who's listening, are they? Just between you and me, the chances are 100%. So more or less. I mean, unless we do something superhuman about emissions, the chances of going to two degrees are more or less 100%. The chances of three degrees are of the order 50%, depending on what we do. And we know those things have impacts, and we know they have impacts that affect life. We know there'll be more heat waves. We know there'll be sea level rises causing economic impacts. Uh, we know there'll be changes in biodiversity because uh, ecosystems can't move fast enough, and so on. So we know there are impacts. And the chances of those are really high. And we can do something about it, because we know exactly what to do. We just stop burning fossil fuels. I mean, it's very hard to do, but we know what to do. Uh, we also know how to reverse it by geoengineering. That's a bit harder to do, but uh, we, we still know what to do. So now let's compare this, what we're talking about here, the geomagnetic reversal. So the chance of it happening in the next century, well, they're pretty small. I mean. They, they don't really, it doesn't really change that fast in the, histori in, the, in the records that we have. So it's not likely it's going to happen in the next 100 years. I mean, roughly they happen once every 200,000 years. The impacts we've been told aren't very large, but okay, that's not my expertise. I don't want pigeons flying into me, so I'll worry about that. <laughs> And can we do anything about it? Well, actually, according to the film, we didn't see the rest of the film, but I looked it up on Wikipedia, and they did do something about it. Surprise, surprise. They, <laughs> they managed to set it going again, and actually it turned out it was us that had caused it to stop anyway. But, um, but what would we do about it? We, we, can't, we probably couldn't mitigate against it in the way we do with climate change by removing the emissions. We, I, I don't think anybody's really going to make the magnetic field reverse back again. But you could adapt to it. But I just question what, why it might not catch on with the public is because what are you going to do? What is it you're going to adapt to? You're going to adapt to these problems with electronic systems and satellite systems. But in a thousand years' time, we won't have those electronic and satellite systems. We'll have something different. So there's no point starting to adapt to it now. Now, there is, of course, for the space weather, which could happen any day, but not for the, not for the reversal. So there were just two other things I wanted to say before I sit down. I think because the question was phrased as natural versus anthropogenic, which I don't think is quite helpful because I think there's a difference between how you would respond to an asteroid impact where, yes, you know what you could do, it'd be very difficult, but you kind of know you could do something as compared to a field reversal. But there is also a psychological aspect, and that's why I was asked about the asteroid impact because there were some congressmen who were very worried about asteroid impacts but not at all worried about climate change. And that's, that's to do with this psychological aspect, I think, of actually it was in the film he said... How could this have happened? Well, we don't, those people don't like to admit that the climate change happened because of something we did. So, and then finally, and just to sort of put it the other way, this is a slightly false debate in the sense that we are capable of multitasking. We ought to be able to deal with more than one hazard at a time. 
and worry about it and think about what to do about it. So it's nice for the debate, but solving climate change doesn't mean that we can't do anything about space weather or geomagnetic reversals or asteroids. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So we've, we've heard that, um, I, I think to summarize, that there will be, is there no effect on, if the field, if the field changes direction and the poles are reversing over a period of time and we have multiple poles, how do we know that, that there won't be more radiation hitting the surface of the planet or secondary effects that can damage life? I mean, how do, we, how do you conclude that it's not significant? Uh, is it working? Uh, maybe not. Go loud, see that. It's on now. It's on. Now. It's on. Okay. Uh, do you hear me? Uh, the issue is that our atmosphere is very thick and it provides excellent shielding against uh, energetic particles. Uh -huh. So even removing the geomagnetic field, we still have excellent shielding to protect from uh, cosmic radiation. So this is a direct. As I mentioned, another indirect effect is via ozone. Mm -hmm. Ozone is destroyed. If ozone is destroyed, then uh, UV, solar UV can penetrate deeper. <clears throat> but ozone is self-consisting, uh, self-consistent mechanism, so it's all the time uh, recovered uh, by sun, uh, sun, uh, sun uh, sunlight. As you know about the huge ozone holes, for instance, in, uh, in Australia, you know, they make a warning of ozone hole coming. Australia, it happens after the Aust or, uh, Australia's winter. So when they're, uh, during the winter, the effect is much stronger of ozone destruction. Mm -hmm. If you destruct ozone in, in uh, tropics, it will be recovered all the time, you know, sleep. So estimates show that it's not that dramatic. At least it cannot melt the gold, uh, the gold <laughs> gate bridge, yeah. as in the movie. Okay. Yeah. Olga, what do you what what do you say? Well, uh, whether particles enter the magnetic field or not depends on um, open field lines, for example. Where right. that's why they enter the polar regions. If you have a quadripolar or multipolar uh, configuration, this means you could have these. Uh, you could have doors yeah. for the particles. In other words, the polar regions will not, so the, the entry points will not be only the polar regions. It will be near the equator or other parts of the planet. Up to now, there hasn't been effects to, directly to life of people, as Ilya is totally healthy, right? <laughs> uh, so that, that's the, the concept. I agree. I agree that there is no... Uh, the, the distribution of the doors of the particles, the entry points will be different, but there will not be an effect. And uh, I was glad to, that you said during reversals there won't be any switching off of the field. What happens for the sun also? The, the, the field has a 22-year uh, periodicity, and you do see multipolar or quadripolar components, so it never disappears. So I think life is protected in such case also. Mm -hmm. I think just in terms of um, the one thing I wanted to comment on, in terms of your plot, uh, looking at the UV decreases. I think you were looking at a global average from when you said the, the scale was 15%. Uh, it, this will, uh, zonal edges. Okay. But uh, I think if you look at Charlie Jackman's work, for example, I think in my mind a better way to kind of picture this would be thinking about the Antarctic ozone hole. Um, which, of course, is anthropogenically driven. Uh, but thinking about the possibility of having a ozone hole like that um, above Vienna. Right. You know, I mean, that's sort of because, you know, that, that's, and, of course, it, it wouldn't have a lifetime of more than 10 years. Um, you know, so it's going to be short. But 
Um, if the field were to decrease and con continue decreasing uh, for a thousand years, that's, that's a real possibility. That there, that there could be extra UV, we're talking UVB radiation, right? Yeah. That, that, could, that could strike the surface of the earth yeah. and potentially, I mean, that stuff's not good for life, right? You, well, it's mean, skin cancer. Particles. It, uh, UV, UV yeah. radiation, not yeah. particles. Yes. Radiation, right. Radiation. So you're talking about increases in skin cancer rates. You're not talking about disasters, but you're talking about something that does have some societal concern. Right. So, so one thing I wanted to ask, or maybe I should be answering it, I'm not sure, is what happened the last time the magnetic field reversed? What happened to life on Earth? So that's 780,000 years ago when it last reversed, and then about 40,000 years ago with the Lachamp event as a period when it was more or less equally weak. At least in the paleo record, to my knowledge, we don't really see any effects on life of those events. But I mean, of course, we wouldn't see very subtle things. We wouldn't see skin cancers in Nairobi. So, right. so, so there, I guess, again, kind of going to the, the drastic extreme, um, there's been no evidence that I'm aware of, solid evidence of any mass extinction event linked to a magnetic reversal. But, but why would there be? Because they're relatively short and you would need a relatively long period to show uh, a mass well, extinction? Well, no, I think uh, mass extinction events are pretty well defined because people study them pretty, pretty uh, intensely. So I, I don't think there is, there is not that correlation. Uh, but they last for millions of years, the extinction events, if I'm not mistaken, okay. as opposed well, to... Well, reverse. it depends on, on which one you're talking about. Um, but, uh, for example, the uh, Cretaceous Paleogene event I don't want to get into that debate, but uh, magnetic reversal, there's not a magnetic reversal there. Right. Okay. Uh, I think the point that you raise, however, is, is a good one, and that is there are, there are, the effects of increasing UV radiation would be subtle, and it's not clear whether or not uh, this, um, you know, there's still some possibility that this could affect um, phytoplankton in some way. Um, and there are some people who are trying to track that down, but that's a very difficult study to make because of the time scale issue that you just raised. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question for you, John. I, I, when, you, when you showed that, the, 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 um, the, 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 the trajectory of the decline, the waning, the decay of the, of the field, you put it out to about 2,000 years as being a reversal, but why would you assume that it would be linear? Um, well, I assumed it's linear just because uh, that's the, the, uh, it's already an outrageous extrapolation and, you, and that's <laughs> the simplest model. But um, the field can't, uh, there's a lag through the mantle. It takes time for the field to diffuse through the, the earth. So, so um, the field is not going to reverse in the next hundred years. You know, that's not possible. Um, so we're close to the limit at the decay of the field right now. So oftentimes it's been described like this, if, if, and that's why this rate is so important. Uh, you know, some people have said that if you just turn the Earth's magnetic field off, that's the type of rate that you would, if you could magically do this in the core, that's the type of rate that you would start to see in terms of decay, because there's this lag in the system. I see. Okay, so, so the linear uh, approximation is pretty conservative, actually. Uh, what's not conservative is, is you know, extrapolating it so far in, in terms of time scales. Mm -hmm. So there's no possibility that could be more swift than that, is what you're saying? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else on that one? Well, what do you see in the core? What do you see in the, in the, in the ice cores from previous reversal? Well, okay, so the one 780,000 years ago is pretty much at the bottom of the oldest core we've got, so I, I wouldn't like to say too much about the rate there. At 40,000 years, it, the, the La Champ event in the Brillium 10 comes on in um, 500 years, something like that. Elia probably knows as well as I do, actually, but the, I think... I think the brilliant rise is, is over about 500 years and then it stays high for about 2,000 years or something like that. So, so it takes about 500 years at least at that time. But, I mean, that's not to say that that's the fastest it can occur, but that's uh -huh. what it did occur in the only one where we got a really good rate. Right. So you don't have a good rate from 780,000 years ago? 
Well, if I look at the data, because I, I did this morning look again, it took about a thousand years, but I, I'm not that confident about the snow accumulation rate down there. So. And just to, just to explain, beryllium it's, gives us a marker of what? What is it? It's cosmic rays. It's directly produced by the cosmic rays, so it will be directly related to the cosmic ray intensity, averaged over some, averaged in some way over the globe, which Elia's models would tell us exactly how. Maybe he wants to talk about it. Do you, do, you want to, do you want to tell us about what you found? Uh, about the beryllium? Uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah, okay. Yes. So, uh, one way of uh, tracing uh, backward solar activity and geomagnetic field is to use cosmogenic isotopes. Those are produced by cosmic rays in the atmosphere of, of Earth. Since they're radioactive, we are sure that they do not exist since the time of, of formation of the solar system. So they are all produced by uh, a cosmic rays, and after production, they are stored in natural archives like ice, ice cores, which can be independently de uh, dated. And then we can estimate the flux of cosmic rays and pinging on Earth in the past. And there are two um, mechanisms uh, modulating the flux of cosmic rays near us, it's solar activity. The more active is the sun, the, the less cosmic rays in pink on Earth. Second is geomagnetic shielding, of course. The higher the geomagnetic field, the less cos co cosmic rays. <coughs> it's not very straightforward to disentangle the two mechanisms, but when we're going to time scales of uh, several thousands years, so tens of thousands of years, we may assume that the sun is roughly constant. I mean, everything is averaged out, so what remains is, on the long term, is geomagnetic field. And La Champ event, if I remember correctly, was exactly discovered by a uh, beryllium 10 record from ice cores. There was just an increase of beryllium 10, and then uh, the first idea was that it's because of weakening of the geomagnetic field. Right. Okay. And are they dangerous, beryllium, the beryllium no, isotopes? Not no, dangerous. They are, they're very small amount, very extremely. Small. So what they measure are, uh, yeah, are traces or single atoms. Okay. So, no. <laughs> but, but they're an indicator of the cosmic ray dose. So, so they're, they're one step further from removing the magnetic field. They're telling you how the cosmic ray intensity changed, which is the next step in the cascade of... of effects we're talking about. So they are so they are a very direct thing. They roughly they roughly I mean the brilliant ten roughly doubles, but I don't know whether that tells you what the cosmic rays doubled. But. Uh, you cannot say that cosmic rays are doubled because it's all depend on the energy. In some energy range it can be orders of magnitude changes. In high energy it can be one percent so effectively it changes but you just cannot say that cosmic ray flux was doubled. You can may say that production of beryllium 10 was doubled. Yes, of so, so let me just say, say that, that I think this has been sort of a, a marvelous um, confirmation of science. Uh, the, the Lachamp event was, was first discovered um, in volcanic lava flows from paleomagnetic work. The ice core record came much later. And uh, very different techniques, very different methods. Uh, confirming that there's an excursion of the Earth's magnetic field. Now, um, work by Carlo Lage and Catherine uh, uh, Cassell has, uh, has focused on the Champ uh, recorded in sediments, and they have argued that um, the onset of the on Le Champ is actually very rapid and uh, comparable um, to the changes in the Earth's magnetic field today in terms of the dipole moment changes. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, uh, circumstantial evidence, but, but interesting. So, I mean, as I understand it, as I understand the modeling, and I could be wrong, so please, you know, correct me, but it, it, we, we don't have any theoretical or physical models that would tell us for sure whether a reversal is happening. Is that, is that correct? <laughs> Put them on the spot. Um, I, I guess yes, but, but it's an interesting question. I think the question that you're 
trying to get at is um, we don't have any theoretical um, solid evidence saying, you know, when the next reversal should occur, independent of the observations that we have today. And that answer is yes. Okay, we can't, there's no periodicity that would tell us that, you know, we should get the next reversal very soon. That, that, that it doesn't work that way in terms of the, mm -hmm. the nature of the field and its statistical nature. But, um, you know, Again, to say that there's no theory, well, gets back to some of the observations I, I said. I mean, there are things here that, that point to um, some of us at least believe this is how reversals occur. Right. So there are clues. There are clues. Can you rule it out? Can you say that definitely it's not happening? Well, that's actually an interesting point. It's, it's a debate, and I, I, think it's, I think it's as foolish to rule it out as to say it's definitely going to happen. Because I think you know, we definitely have these, these clues here. It's just the question of the extrapolation. Do you think there are implications for life if a reversal is upon us now? Well, I mean, uh, you know, as, as people will go tonight and they'll, they'll, they'll go out with their friends and they'll go to bars, uh, you know, people in my field will go out and, and they'll uh, ask themselves uh, sort of interesting questions like, um, you know, uh, you know, if you could tell your descendants, uh, um, you know, uh, give them some clue what might be uh, um, valuable a thousand years from now, um, you know, what would you give them? You know, some people might say, well, a cup of clean water, maybe, maybe that's what you would choose. Um, in, in this issue, I would say probably suntan lotion. I mean, I, I, I don't think that the, 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 the effects are going to be so dramatic. But, but um, I do think the UV uh, increases are, are probably one of the most important things. But it probably is not going to rise above the issue of, of just in, in, uh, increased skin cancer rates, as far as I would say right now. Okay. Eric, did you have something? No, it was, it was slightly going back to the previous point that John was making. Just, I guess, actually, what we're worrying about with the impacts is not whether the magnetic field reverses. I mean, that's certainly of interest to people in this room, but whether it weakens. And so the Lachamp event is actually a good example of that, because you would for sure have thought, if you'd been living at the beginning of the Lachamp event, that there was a reversal coming, but it didn't actually happen. It, it went right down to a low magnetic field and then, then aborted. So... Um, so so the answer to your question about reversal seems quite impossible to answer, but a, but a weakening would still be worrying, even if, even yeah. if it didn't reverse. Right. right. Okay. Olga. Olga has one more question, then Just we're going to open it up. Just to make a comment Sorry. concerning, you know, all this understanding of the Mayan calendar and the end of the world, and this recurs every three, five years. So the message we should give to everybody in society is that these solar storms are not so dramatic. They're not going to kill uh, life on Earth. But of course, what is important is how fast we will become like Mars, where there is no magnetic field, global inherent no magnetic field. And uh, the atmosphere has been ripped off by the solar wind from the sun. So that would be something with a scale that is much further. But on a daily scale, the space weather effects will not have such uh, misinformation, all this misinformation to the general public for uh, dramatic effects and uh, threats of life, okay? What suffers is mostly technological, uh, technological, and we rely upon them. Of course we rely upon them. 100 years ago we didn't, so mm -hmm. we have to take care. Right. We're going to open up the debate um, to the public, uh, to the audience. Does anybody have a question? Yes. So just a comment. Through good fortune and some contribution from United Airlines, I missed my connection to Vienna in, at O'Hare, but this allowed me to go to the Field Museum on Sunday where there are exhibits on mass extinctions that were caused by human emigration to Australia and North America. And I'm just asking, is there any evidence that this is, that in the past from ice cores or any historical evidence that uh, such a scale of uh, extinction would be associated with a solar event or the Earth's magnetic field. Do you, have a you said ice cores, so I guess I'm the person to answer, but I mean, I'm not, ice cores only go back in a very short period of geological time. So, 
But all I can say is that in the weakenings of the magnetic field that we see in the ice core record, there's no evidence in parallel terrestrial or marine records of an extinction. And as far as I know, in the, and, and John and others mentioned this, in past major extinctions, there's no evidence of unusual geomagnetic reversal activity. But that's as far as the geological record so far will allow us to go. It would, it would as John said, it would be possible to delve into the Le Champ event in particular in more detail so far than so far and look for changes, particularly in phytoplankton, for example. See, you can look at colours and things like that to see whether there were changes in UV in the sediments. But I don't, there's no evidence at the moment that I'm aware of. I think that's been looked at pretty extensively in the literature, and there has never been a link made um, despite concerted effort. Anybody else? Yeah. No, uh, from the responses, I've, I understand that the that a, a flip of the of the Earth's magnetic field is not likely to happen within before about 500 years in the future. In the future, we have no idea what technology what technologies will exist. It's like comparing what exists now with what what existed in the year 1500. Also, we've heard that the effects are likely to be minor. So I wonder if we could hear a little bit more about the other major natural threats, which are more, less likely, but could have much more significant effects. Maybe, Eric, you could just expand a little bit more on what you said. Well, um, there are probably people in this room and certainly people in this building who know more about those than I do. So. <laughs> Volcanic eruptions, of course. We know we have large volcanic eruptions now and then. So Tambora, most people are familiar with Tambora 1815, which certainly caused major effects. They only lasted for a couple of years, a few years at the most, but they certainly had major effects on agriculture in even, even in places far away from them, and we've no idea what effect they had near to the eruption sites. Um, and there are larger eruptions than that. We do actually measure volcanic eruptions in ice cores, and so we've got some ideas about the frequency of eruptions of different sizes. So, you know, eventually there will be a big volcanic eruption, and yes, you should probably worry about it. Some of these things, I think um, it's maybe worth mentioning that governments do worry about these things. So, for instance, the space weather, which, it, which is a slightly different variant of what we were talking about, that's on the UK government's risk register, which is the top 10 things it thinks it ought to be guarding against. I don't think volcanic eruptions are, although the impact of volcanic eruptions on flights is something that certainly people worry about, even, even if not on life. The asteroid impact, you're way outside my expertise, but uh, uh, NASA worry about it because it buys them money. But. <laughs> right. Anybody else? Any questions? Yes. Do you want to go to the mic? You can line up if you feel moved to do that. Okay, so from what I understood, um, we should not expect any mass extinction, neither due to a multipolar nature of the magnetic field during a a reversal or an, an excursion, nor uh, due to the decrease of the intensity, right? But my question is, um, do we have any idea about more subtle changes uh, concerning life? Okay, we're not gonna die, all of us, but do we expect any, for example, I remember you showed some page from your book where you talked about DNA changes. Did I get that correctly? Sorry, can you, can you repeat the question? Uh, I, I didn't quite, I didn't quite get it. Uh, this is for astronauts which are uh, unshielded in... Uh, okay. Yeah, or in extravehicular work in uh, spacecraft, okay. in interplanetary medium, or the ISS. So there, there are biological effects from particles, but not within the shield. The, they're not dominant within okay. the shielding magnetic field, so... Okay, so it, it's not just that there's not going to be mass extinctions, but there's not going to be even 
we do not expect even some subtle changes on the biology of humans, right? Okay, thank you. Of course, there are some um, scientists, some um, trend in the community which uh, think that there are um, there there is an interest in such studies, at least uh, these geomagnetic storms that have are an effect of the masses from the sun impinging on the Earth's magnetic field. So these cause variations of the magnetic field, and there is a trend to try to understand if there is if there are biological effects, and there are studies that have been proving uh, these effects of the variations of the magnetic fields in direct secondary uh, effects on life, on the brain, on the heart. Okay, so the, okay, thank you very much. Yes. Now this is a very unscientific question with a, a hidden agenda. Um, could I ask you to, uh, with reference to the different uh, phenomena that you're talking about, to evaluate the, the threat on a scale of one to ten to, to our species? So that would include those of us who are here today, today and our possible and future progeny. Wow, I guess we better go through everybody. You wanna, he's asking about how you would rank the, the risks Oh. <laughs> what do you worry about it most, I guess? Well, uh, uh, place the geomagnetic field weakening, I, will, I would rate, uh, rate as quite low risk. So it's not a danger for life. There might be some minor effect like uh, cancer, maybe some DNA small changes, but it doesn't, it wouldn't lead to mass Ext extinction. Then, of course, the climatic changes, that's m much more imp imp important than we all should face it. Of course, some uh, unlikely effects or very rare effects like uh, an asteroid impact, that would be also dramatic, but we don't know uh, how to Rank it, and there was estimates. I'm not expert at that of the on the prob uh, probabilities, but I think we should first consider most uh, the most probable effects of Eric said, hundred percent probability. I agree that uh, from the discussion today, it's obvious anthropogenic um, influence to the climate is what is most important and most. Um, abruptly rising, it seems, the, as a threat. Um, space weather, we have a fleet of spacecraft. In July, there will be a new mission. It will touch the sun. Yeah. So all the knowledge we have, we accumulate. I'm optimistic that there will be a way to harness, to continue harnessing this. But climate change seems to be... We have to understand what human race is doing to destroy our planet. We have to understand that and stop it, if possible. Um, so, I, I agree, climate change is uh, the biggest concern, but I, I think um, the question may have been asking about mass extinction of the species. So, if, if even if it was not, let me just answer that, and, and I would say um, an asteroid impact <laughs> followed by uh, a mega... Um, Volcanic eruption. Um, uh, I'm not talking about probabilities here. I'm just talking about the events. Um, then climate change and uh, magnetic reversal isn't on the same scale. It's sort of uh, down at the bottom somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I guess you're going to get the same answer from all of us, more or less. But I mean, I think you need to think, and, that, and they do exist plots of impact in terms of millions of deaths or whatever it is and frequency in terms of how many, how many million years will it recur in. And you'll see asteroid impacts in one corner and, and this magnetic reversal in the, in the other corner, I guess, and climate change somewhere in between where it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be the end of life on Earth, climate change, but there will be deaths and economic impacts. Um, the asteroid impact, of course, the big asteroid impact could wipe out everything. 
but I, you, you also asked what kept me awake at night, and that doesn't keep me awake at night. I, I know I'm going to die anyway. So. What keeps you awake? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Um, well, climate change certainly worries me. I mean, I'm very, I'm very used to it, but the certainty that within a generation... Well, it's the fact that my generation is leaving to the next generation a planet in a worse state than... It, than it, we arrived in. That's, it doesn't keep me awake exactly, but that's, that's what should keep me awake at night. Well, I'm going to answer too, just because I've been thinking about this quite a bit, and climate change and ocean change, specifically ocean acidification, are, would be really high on my list, but I'm also interested, because I don't understand, I'm also interested in the effects of a, potential, of a reversal on life if it were to happen while we have already imperiled so many uh, life forms on our planet already. So I know that we have had previous reversals that have not been linked to mass extinctions, but life today is different from what it was. You know, a third of our species, the known species on the planet are at risk of extinction. I, some of them navigate by the magnetic poles to breed and to, to eat. Um, I don't know, and I don't think it's been discovered, how, how these changes in, in the field will affect that. I'm not predicting catastrophe, but I just don't understand it, and so I would like to see some more work done on that, taking into account, um, because a lot of what we've talked about here has talked about the effects on our planet f with a shield that's, that's still holding, that, that, is still, that is still at a, full, a pretty full strength, and I would like to see some of these other factors knitted into the analyses, and so far in the literature I haven't seen that. Anybody else? Yes. I'd like to, uh, that we think about a threat that would come indirectly. Like, for instance, uh, climate change, this creates um, more wealth for the rich, less for the poor, tension, war about water, conflict. So at the end, this could have a, a toll on the human species much bigger because this, this may generate uh, wars or eventually even nuclear uh, conflict. Um, Another aspect, maybe with space weather, so what would happen when you, would you depend more and more on the spacecraft infrastructures and some of them are knocked out, so is there a risk that this could lead also to a human, a human or a nuclear conflict due to the fact that some of the country may take it as a wrong signal and this could trigger also intercontinental war. So is there a risk that uh, something would happen to a spacecraft that uh, uh, would lead to an even further catastrophe for, for humans? I think that was a comment. Right. Is there a risk? Did, did, what was the actual question? <laughs> Sorry. It's very difficult to hear in here. Yeah, to look if you have also um, indirect catastrophe scenarios, like the one, okay, climate change, we know that could be a gradual effect, but that, this could lead to tensions between countries that could be even more catastrophic than the right. effect itself. So uh, if you could answer on this, and also whether space weather could lead also to an indirect right. catastrophe scenario. Okay, indirect, quest indirect effects of climate change and of space weather. So on wars and things like that, I suppose. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not the expert on any of this. So. <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, you're asking about the space. Well, I mean, obviously, you've answered your own question. Of course, it, it could have an impact. I mean, space, but, but now we're definitely talking about space weather because that's something that could happen in five years' time. Not the, whereas the magnetic reversal, the, we've already said the scale of the time scale on which it could occur, we're not going to be using present present generation spacecraft by then, so that you just can't, we just can't even begin to answer the question for the geomagnetic reversal. Uh, all this um, forecasting of the reversal reminded me, uh, but on a smaller scale, of what the solar cycle uh, predictions are. And we thought that uh, what the activity at the sun will be, and you remember we had this grand minimum for about three years, which was not expected. So. Uh, of course, of course, the effect on our spacecraft is very important by any event at the sun, and this is something which is not harnessed yet. I think it's, it has to, it can happen. Yeah. 
I happened to, uh, I, uh, I had a spacecraft operating actually during the Halloween storm. We were knocked out, we lost the spacecraft uh, for some time. Right. So I imagine now we are going to be dependent on a positioning system, it's going to drive our vehicle, yeah, no the driver, and suddenly you will have a system where you will lose the ability to, to have access to this positioning system because you have a space storm. So we need to think of a very robust way how we integrate all this uh, technology from spacecraft that is going to, to dominate our life. I think this is a goal of the space agencies. This should be a goal of space agencies to produce this robust uh, technology to shield, to help our spacecraft, maybe. Yeah, so I, I think that um, at least for spacecraft that routinely go through the South Atlantic anomaly, um, there is, uh, and new spacecraft, there is shielding already in place, and they, they routinely go into a, um, they call a safe mode. Essentially, they turn off their operations. Um, because they know that there's going to be increased flux through this area. So, you know, people are aware of this already. Um, um, in terms of space weather effects, I'm actually, I think the bigger concern is, is um, power infrastructure uh, in, in many, many countries. I, I think, you know, uh, industrial societies are terribly vulnerable to this right now. Uh, and they're much more interconnected. The, the systems are much more interconnected. Yes, we've got a question here. It seems to me that we don't have enough information regarding the, what happens during the last magnetic reversal. Is that right? Yes. We don't have any, uh, any information associated with what's happened in the last magnetic reversal. We have some information. Such so, as? Well, from, from the, are you talking about in terms of extinction or are you talking about in terms of? There is no extinction, but effects on the planet. something happened, right? Associated with the magnetic reversals in the past. Well, I mean, the last magnetic reversal in the, the period of the last magnetic reversal, which would be say 770 to 790,000 years ago, there is nothing unusual about it in any paleoclimate record. That's all we can say. I, I, don't, know, I don't know what, what information you would be wanting to have. So why do we have to worry about the, the coming one? Well, there, there could be effects that we can't see. I mean, there are a lot of things you can't see in, in paleo records. But I mean, we, we wouldn't be able to tell, as I said, we wouldn't be able to tell if there were animals dying of cancer. But. Because uh, as a geologist, we can trace events back to four billion years. So there is nothing we trace during this magnetic reversal in the, in the last 700,000 years. Nothing to observe or in the, in the record. So, Not clear? So, sorry, can you, can you just say what the question is? What are you, what are you asking? My question is that uh, for the last magnetic reversal, yep. something happened during this period of reversal. Some so, observations on the Earth, or the climate, or whatever. Yes, anything. I mean, nothing unusual happened. That's all I can answer you. I'm not sure what, what other answer I can give. It, it doesn't look any different from any other time in, in terms of climate or, or terrestrial records or marine records. OK, so that, nothing, <laughs> nothing happened. <laughs> well, nothing observable, nothing that we know of so far. Because we don't know information, or it's difficult to get information, or because nothing happened. Do we? Okay. Yeah. No, I think we've answered it. Thanks. Is this, there's another one down there? Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, myself is, is a meteorologist. Um, my question is volcanoes. I believe volcanoes are a natural threat rather than um, uh, anthropogenic threat. However. I, I just wonder if you change the um, geomagnetic field, would that change the eruption of, of the volcanoes, which you know have some kind of uh, threat on the um, um, Earth? You're asking whether a shift in the in the direction of the magnetic field has an effect on volcanism? Is yes. That what, um, 
No, no um, you know, I, I think the principal thing with volcanoes is where the volcano is located and its size. Um, so, uh, you know, these are going to be the principal variables uh, on, on, on how um, quickly, uh, we're talking about a mega eruption, um, you know, how much of the Earth is going to be influenced. The magnetic field effects are going to be um, completely separate from this. Margit, you have a question? I have actually a comment uh, regarding the ozone hole over Vienna that has been um, brought up um, earlier. So, um, well, to, for the ozone hole to, to um, be created, uh, we need the polar vortex, I mean the polar night and the polar vortex. So I do not see that we will have a, a polar, um, sorry, an ozone hole over Vienna in the sometime soon. I mean, you need the polar night and with a, the, the, the magnetic field being changed, it doesn't necessarily mean, uh, oh, well, the polar night will still be at the South Pole or North Pole, depending on the season, of course. But maybe I missed the point there. Well, the, the pole, the, the point is that the field is a very complex morphology. So what Charlie Jackman and, and his colleagues modeled were um, you know, these very complex uh, field morphologies. And basically, he could get an ozone hole at any latitude. Without a polar night? Without a polar night? Without a polar night. Um, I mean, we have climate experts here, but uh, we, to mine, I mean, you need the, the ozone chemistry, the catalytic, catalytic destruction of, um, of the at the polar stratospheric cloud to create uh, the ozone hole. And then this vortex is being um, diluted uh, when we have springtime in the, on the no North Pole. In, we have somebody yeah, this. maybe. Are, are, you, are you wanting to speak to this? I could, I could speak to this. I mean, there are certainly more bigger experts than me in the, in the audience, but I can still, I think I can say something. Um, polar night is needed to create an ozone hole with the current concentrations of halogen that we have in the stratosphere. It's around 3 ppb of chlorine, and with that amount of chlorine, you need these cold temperatures combined with sunshine that you typically see in Antarctica. But if the emissions of CFCs and halons and so on had continued unabated, then we would have gotten into this regime that has been published in several papers called the world avoided. And that would have led to a complete destruction of the ozone, ozone layer. All over, the, all over the earth, especially in the tropics. So there it would be really bad. So under that kind of scenario, we would also get a, like something like an ozone hole also over Vienna and elsewhere. But it's true that with what we have today, the amount of chlorine and, and bromine we have in the atmosphere today, uh, you need the conditions that we see in the polar regions to create massive ozone destruction. That's very, very clear. Thank you very much. Just, can, I, can I just say something? So I think, I think we're probably using the word hole in two different, in two different contexts here. So the, we think of the ozone hole as the thing that happened over Antarctica, which was caused by chlorine chemistry. But the ozone destruction that we were talking about here, I think, is more through the nitrogen chemistry than the, than the chlorine chemistry. So it's a, it's a different chemistry. It's a different mechanism. It's, it's more what Paul Crutzen talked about rather than what Molina and Roland talked about. Exactly. Yeah. The, the, the ozone destruction that would uh, be caused by uh, like a weakening of the magnetic field and more bombardment of particles from the sun and so on, that would be nitrogen chemistry. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. nitrous oxide, NO, that, uh, uh, that would, uh, uh, N2O and NO, uh, nitrogen chemistry. Uh, same as you see, for example, from supersonic transport. When one, one was afraid that supersonic transport, Concord and so on, could cause ozone depletion. That's through nitrogen chemistry. And that would be the effect of uh, uh, more bombardment of cosmic rays or, or particles from the sun and so on. So it's not chlorine in that case. Thank you very much. Angelo, did you still have a question? Yeah. I was tempted not to, to say anything because of my role. Or I uh, and it is a rock physics president, division president, but um, I have a question, I have the answer, so don't worry. Uh, <laughs> are, we, are we really know all the information to say we are completely sure that there will not be an impending reversal 
and no real great consequences for life? My answer is no, we have not complete information. And just uh, to remind uh, an article on trends and plant sciences where I collaborated with biologists, we put a small angiosperm plants for several days in a zero field with Helmut's coils. They measured DNA before, DNA after. This statistic was not so much. A biologist, when it's 10, is great number for us. It needs thousands, millions, and so on. But all the time we found changes, mutation. So my idea, my feeling is that when there is a magnetic reversal, it's a big, large-scale transition. We don't know exactly. It, it is no big change, but there will be some change that takes all the Earth. So for me, it's a great transition could be a great crisis, could be a great opportunity for life. And when I speak life, I don't intend only human beings, life of the, our planet. And the last, uh, Bruce Matuyama, uh, 708,000 uh, years, 700,000 years ago, a little less than one million years, so it's much better. We were not the same species. So maybe this could be a good opportunity for life to evolve. It's a fascinating thought that, that changes, that, that activity within the core of our planet, within this molten core that is moving, the outer core, can affect, could affect life on the surface. I mean, it's a fascinating concept. It's very poetic. Thank you for bringing that up. I think we're at an end. I think we actually have to Cut, cut things off. It's, it's three o'clock. Um, thank you for coming. Very much appreciate your being here. <laughs>